Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, I, I love it. where audience <laughs> feedback is already happening. It's good, good participation early on. Uh, so everyone get a chance to catch the devs on stage? Yeah, I was telling people my feature that I was the most excited about was the buffer. Uh, you know, I'm like a geospatial guy, as I think you're gonna find out, and previously doing buffers in Tableau was very time consuming, required a lot of like pre-preparation, and you probably needed to use like another geospatial software package to do it. Uh, no, no more, mm -hmm. awesome. All right. So, we are here for optimal territory planning with Tableau. Now, I'm gonna ask ourselves, what is this item, and what does it have to do with territory planning? Does anyone have any guesses? Yes, quality? Close, but not quite. Equal oh, I like, this is actually good. This is not at all what I thought, but mm -hmm. this is good. So I'm gonna give you guys a few more clues. This is, these are items that I would compare to territory planning software. <laughs> so this one, up in the upper left, we have a banana slicer. In the lower left, we have a hot dog slicer with integrated ketchup holder. That, if you've never seen one before, is an asparagus peeler. That's right, only useful for peeling asparagus. This, for when you only have one utensil and are confronted with a whole pizza that's not been sliced yet. It's the integrated pizza slicer and fork. This is the tomato holder and slicer. This is for when you're afraid to get your hand more than six inches to a knife. Maintains a very wide range of separation for you. And this is the one click Butter patter. <laughs> That's right. These are all items that you could go and you could buy it today on the internet. But this dispenses one click of or one pat of butter easily with a click of your hand. I also find that a butter knife works very well, but other people beg to differ. So, does anyone have any more guesses about? Yes, sir. Room. Very close. You have got it, <laughs> nailed it. These are all unitaskers, which I also believe every piece of territory planning software I have seen is also a unitasker. What do they have in common? You break them out once or twice a year, usually right after you bought it, then you put it away somewhere where it takes up space, or in the case of territory planning, budget, in the back of a dusty drawer or on your old laptop that you forgot that you didn't move the software license off of when you got your new laptop because you only use the thing once a year. And you can't use it for anything else. You want to slice a mango and you've only got a hot dog slicer? Out of luck. <laughs> you've got a knife, mango, hot dog, tomato, no problem. Let me show you today that Tableau desktop with prep, it's like your knife. So, with that out of the way, who are we? I'm Hunter, this is Justin. We're here for optimal territory planning with Tableau. I hope you are too. A little bit about me. I'm a data scientist at Tableau Software. Uh, this is me as I was uh, doing one of my uh, races this summer. A little bit about me, I'm a former professional moth trapper. That's right, you heard it correctly. I trapped uh, gypsy moths in North Idaho. That was before I was a data scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I have two kids. There they are, doing some climbing. I'm a runner and an aspiring rock climber, largely because of these two, who I have to figure out how to get on and off the wall. And I'm known among my friends and family as having a spreadsheet for everything. Hi, uh, I'm Justin Kruger. Um, I've been, or I am an off-road enthusiast. Uh, I like to go out to the sand dunes and go rock crawling. That's our, my passion. 
a uh, fantasy basketball owner, been 10 years with some college buddies that we are doing a dynasty in and still going strong, uh, even through some hiccups. Uh, Pitbull caretaker, that's my dog Stormy in the uh, bottom left for you guys, I think. We adopted her last, or two years ago from Houston. Uh, and she is a handful. And then recently married to my wife, uh, Katie, in the top right. So now you know a little bit about us and my former moth trapping career. Uh, so let's take a moment, and if I could have you guys uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. So how many of you are in sales operations? All right, very sales ops heavy crowd. Love it. Uh, so for those folks within, uh, is anyone in sales? All right, cool. There's always a couple. Awesome. Uh, so for you folks, who here is a manager? Oh, wow. Sweet. Manager heavy. Uh, who here is an analyst or not another IC role? All right. Wow, we, I feel like we got about like 40% manager, 60% IC maybe in the room. Cool. So now if we just all take a minute. So one of the things we're here to do at Tableau Conference, besides having you guys just listen to us talk at you, is to kind of network and meet other people and learn from each other. Uh, so let's just take a minute and introduce yourself to the person next to you and say hi and uh, you know who you are, where you're from, et cetera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> hey, everybody. Man, I love the enthusiasm and excitement. <laughs> but there will be ample time afterwards for everyone to continue the conversation. <laughs> Attention. All right. So on to, oops, on to our session agenda. So we're going to a little bit talk talk a little bit about why we want to use Tableau for territory planning. We've covered it a little bit. You know, we believe Tableau is sort of like the knife in the drawer of unitaskers. We're going to talk about some general best practices for territory planning because even if you nail it from a technical standpoint with the the tools, if you know your leadership isn't aligned, if your processes aren't in place, you're still not going to have a successful territory planning and rollout. Uh, we're going to talk about how you might want to choose your metrics, right? Because as part of the territory planning process, we're going to decide how we want to determine equality in our territories and what metrics may be good for that or may not be good for that. Um, we're going to talk about clustering geographic units, which sounds probably very technical at this point of the presentation, but that's really the key to being able to utilize Tableau effectively to build your territories. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to do a, a demo and we're going to show you how we do it. And uh, I think you're going to be very impressed uh, with the, the speed and balance that we're able to achieve. So why Tableau? So first of all, we think the Tableau is awesome value proposition. Most of you are here because your organization already has Tableau, right? So you get to use something that is already present that you're already paying for today. You don't have to buy this specialized tool that you trot out for maybe one month a year, and then it just sort of like goes stagnant the rest of the time. You know, our experience has been most of these territory planning softwares are very expensive. Uh, typically, they are not as up to date as they should be. The last one we used looked like a software that I used in 1999. Uh, it crashed a lot. The first thing they told when they trained me on it was, you know, basically always be saving, like never don't be saving. <laughs> because it will crash. The question is just when. Uh, the integration, right? Another thing, if you're using an off-the-shelf territory planning software, 
and you decide, hey, my boss told me that we really need to be using this optimization model or random forest or decision trees or some new regression model, right? If it's not in there, like, you're out of luck. You know, too bad, right? Prep and Tableau Desktop, but especially Prep in this case, integrate with R and with Python. So between those two, that covers pretty much any package or library you could ever want or hope to use. So you don't have to wait around for us or another vendor to add that in. You've already got that in there. Yep. The speed. So we were able, at Tableau, to reduce the time that it took us to create a territory. So we use this for about a third of our sales force, this method right here. We were able to reduce the time it took us to create a territory by about 55 to 65% per territory. Not only that, never don't have the problems with crashing, don't have the problems with trying to train the new person on it every single year. They probably already know Tableau. Like everything, it's much smoother. The communication is also what we like, right? I was talking to someone here earlier. We'd have this problem where you had like one person that was licensed for the planning software, and then you, you would get them in a room with the sales leader, and they'd be like, well, can we change this thing? We'd go to change the thing. There'd be like a spinny wheel for three minutes, and then it would not quite work out, and then we'd have to like change another thing in the spinny wheel, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, I think I have a customer call I gotta go take, because uh, <laughs> they've just basically sat in a room for 10 or 15 minutes and just like watched a wheel spin and seen one version of a territory, right? With this, we can cut territory so quickly that it's pretty trivial to get someone involved either to review a few different versions, or with our really engaged sales leadership, we might actually sit down in a room or on a WebEx and build a whole territory together. It's quick enough that we can do that and still respect their time. Right. And lastly, happier people, right? People that use Tableau generally really like to use Tableau. We really like to use Tableau. I like to use it a lot better than any other territory software that I've ever encountered in the wild. Uh, and you can use all your transferable skills. And not only that, your data is already, so when, now when someone asks you to make a dashboard of their future territory, all that data is already in Tableau. It's already there, you just built it. So you're like three clicks away from getting a dashboard out as well. Right. So here's just a quick example of what a territory might look like that we had created in Tableau. Right. Each one of those colors is a distinct territory and we've quickly displayed some balance metrics on the bottom. We can wand over, et cetera. So now Justin's gonna cover some territory planning uh, best practices for us. Awesome, thanks Hunter. Yeah, I forgot to mention I'm a manager on sales operations in our uh, global planning and strategy team, so get lucky enough to uh, help lead Hunter and a couple other folks from the analyst community uh, that works with our regional teams and our direct sales teams for kind of the go-to-market strategy. So as we talked, I'm gonna walk through a little bit on the, from a butter knife standpoint, I'm gonna pass it over to my other hand here and walk through kind of the business side and how you guys can take this and like Hunter was saying, we have a, uh, any good tool actually needs a process. Most data always comes from a process or a collection of things, right? And this is at Tableau, we'll walk through um, kind of our philosophy or methodology from an end-to-end -end standpoint. Um, but a couple things here is defining the timeline and we'll go more in depth to this um, in terms of like how you break in the end-to-end -end processes. Uh, you have a set of engaged stakeholders. So Hunter was talking about earlier, um, being in sales operations or BI or kind of, I'll just say any back room team, right, where you're doing the number crunching and you're providing numbers to direct sellers or direct managers, there's always that conflict of like, oh, I already did it, I'm not gonna do it again, or you wanna make it an iterative process. And so having those stakeholders engaged is what we found to be very successful um, as we walk through today, of that we can sit down in a meeting room or sit down on some type of cloud phase or a way to interact um, remotely and be able to get to common results of, okay, well, here's the challenge of my job and here's the challenge of your job and let's meet together and get an agreed upon uh, set of territories that we can get ready to roll out. Um, one thing that I'll say from a success is clearly having defined segmentation um, and or rules of engagement for your sales team. So what I mean by that is as you begin to scale or something begins to grow, actually having something written, written down in a language that people can understand and read through and understand that a SIC code of nine is for the health or the state and local team or 80, a SIC code that starts with eight zero is for the healthcare team from the accounts or 
hierarchies that are over $100,000 are part of this segment. Just being very crystal clear about why you guys are segmenting and having a rule engine behind that not only helps for carving and doing segmentation, but also to in-year for lead routing, for scaling up processes, for bringing in overlay businesses, um, thinking BDRs and SDRs and other teams that are gonna be supporting the direct sales market as you, or the strategy as you go to market. Um, having a headcount and growth plan, that's a fluid process and it's very challenging. However, having that in place is critical, at least from a process standpoint, as you go through this timeline for being able to understand kind of what target you're trying to achieve or what you're trying to actually get to and doing checkpoints as you go along and what your bookings are and as you roll things up. And then lastly, we'll touch a little bit, but really clear definitions of a customer and other key metrics so that it's transparent to others as you start to scale and try to do self-service analytics that you actually understand what these things mean, not just a, well, it's in Tableau and a calculation, you gotta really be precise and be have it written out that this is what we're defining a customer as. It's a transaction that actually has a software purchase or a transaction that is, you know, a customer has bought within the last 12 months, things like that that really like resonate and are simple and under, to understand. So we'll go through this and all the, I encourage that you guys will get these slides so don't feel like you gotta squint your eyes to get to it. I want you guys to be able to take these back to your local machines and be able to look through it and so that's why I wanna leave all the content on here. Oh yeah, I'll interject. So at the end of this presentation, there's gonna be a GitHub link up. You're gonna wanna take a picture of that. You're gonna be able to go directly to that GitHub link and download all of the files, the prep workflow, the workbook, and our PowerPoint presentation. And it's gonna be available right now. So you don't have to wait for a week or whatever, whenever we get around to email and stuff, it'll be available right now. So don't feel like you have to take a picture of everything because you'll be able to have it like five minutes after you walk out the door. So going to our end-to-end -end sales planning process. Now this is what we use at Tableau. I just recommend that this is more of a helping guiding principle. It's, um, as we talk to other peers, uh, as we do done customer calls, things like that, these are just common aspects and processes and just methodologies that others are doing as well. Um, as it relates to territory carving at Tableau, we do it once a year. Uh, sure, there's the attrition and people are coming and going, and we might have to rebalance a couple territories, but from a general standpoint, and we'll talk a little bit, like how do you do that if you have mass turnovers or you do those things, what are some techniques that you could do um, to help your sales team and to make it so that you don't have to always recarve? carve um, but from a general methodology, we do it once a year. That's we set the territories, we let them ride out, we let them see what happens, and then, then the next annual planning process that we were talking about today is when we'll kind of reevaluate and go, our go-to-market strategies. Um, so we think of the end-to-end -end process in really three buckets. The first bucket is your go-to-market strategy. That's a approximately a two-month period. For us, we used to have a uh, January 1st kickoff kind of of our annual plan, or our uh, annual calendar, and so we would start in June-ish or July-ish, um, and then run all the way up until the first weekend of July, or January, when we'd then go through the process of territory rollout and updating our CRMs and all that stuff. Um, the second phase is our territory and uh, quota creation. This is where we'll get into the technical side today, since that is really a time-consuming part. Uh, this is where you'll start really seeing the bottoms up, start meshing with that tops down, uh, methodology of the go-to-market. And then finally, we won't touch at all really on it today, but I want to call this out as an important process as you begin to scale out is the compensation plan, um, taking about a month to really do that right um, as you start getting into hundreds and thousands of sellers that you wanna ensure that your leadership and your teams know that it's, it's not like a weak process to get comp plans out. It does take time, it does need to be validated, and it does need to be uh, thought is a critical part of the end-to-end -end, uh, process. So first we're gonna jump into revenues by target. So what we're talking about here is really that, tops level, that top level of, okay, our company is wanting to grow at 20%, we're expecting to be at this number. In general, this is kind of what we're thinking from a bookings number next year that we're gonna have. Our, internally, we work a lot with our FP&A team for what are kind of the bookings numbers that they're looking through that will lead to the revenue uh, as we report out and kind of start putting headcount company-wide plans together. Uh, and then we work in tandem with that to now take that number and start distributing down. So the we think of it from a global level, breaks down to your regions of 
country clusters, and then within that, you kind of get into your subregions of your the docks and the uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, for the U.S., you have the East Market, the West Market, the Central Market, things like that. Um, some of your organizations might be very simple in, uh, in the regards to just how you break it out, but this is really starting and having that transparency that's shared across your different planning teams um, and having a way to kind of use this methodology to push it downwards. This is really this, the get-go, the starting place as you begin your uh, market sizing. Some of the questions that we like to ask in these phases are what are uh, these markets in which we want to grow faster? So this is where you can kind of look and dock. Do we want to kind of up that lever because we're going to add a new corporate headquarters and we're going to hire direct, so we expect to uplift there. Um, this is where you'll start kind of doing that type of uh, modeling and methodology. Um, what markets maybe are starting to get saturated that we need to collapse down in the next year? Those type of questions is where really where we start to focus in on this and start talking about system impacts and downstream so that as we get going throughout the whole end-to-end -end planning process, we are able to really um, scale outwards. Next is segmentation. This is where we're getting to those revenue targets and how we're kind of thinking about it and really now starting to define it. And we really think of segmentation, and I'll start just really at three basic buckets. Um, so geography of where you cluster countries or where you cluster states and how you think about how that shapes your subregions and your districts and your teams. Uh, next is your vertical markets. So this is going to be, for some of you guys, maybe within a healthcare business, it's different parts of the healthcare of payers and providers or uh, technology companies. For, like for us, we have um, financial services, we have healthcare, we have public sector of the federal space and the public sector, or the SLED space with education and state and local. Um, but this is really start defining out those vertical markets and what they are so that it's very crystal clear um, as it opposed to kind of the line of business that we'll go into next, which is really, I kind of think that this is not your, not necessarily a fallback, but it's kind of your general, like, who covers this market and what are those different segments? So, for example, you could have the difference between enterprise and commercial, um, or within commercial, you break it down into segments of small, medium business, mid-market business, things like that, so you can start thinking about how you size those teams and those markets. Oh yeah, also with the segmentation, this is really where, as I was talking earlier, the rules of engagement from uh, uh, routing and definition sets, this is where putting those type of definitions on paper will pay dividends long term, I promise you that. You'll start actually using those for how you route leads, for how you work with your other systems teams, and you'll be able to have that as clear, uh, transparent, like, you know, uh, articles that sales reps read when they begin and they're going through boot camp, things like that, so that as your sales team start collaborating across, they actually know rules of engagement and know kind of what, how to quote unquote stay in your lane or stay in your swim lane. Um, this is an extremely critical uh, portion to this end-to-end uh, -end process. Uh, next, we'll talk through really briefly so we can get into the other stuff, but resourcing model, thinking about what are the different types of sellers and career paths that you want to have as it relates to the direct sales team and how you overlay those teams as it relates to pre-sales and post-sales. Um, so, pyramid of success here, we have our strategic field reps um, where they have a really small, finite, for some people it might be the top 1,000, it might be the top 100, the top 10 uh, company size wise. Um, and then you start breaking down into your bigger market sizes in terms of just volume. Um, we're speaking a little bit more towards the US side, but where you get to really small business is a big amount, but it's so many accounts for people to cover and you just need more um, ge geographic based uh, representation and service to those. I won't go too far because Hunter's gonna touch a lot on this in the next sections of our technical demos and kind of the methodologies there, but territory construction, this is what we're gonna show how you can do this with Tableau and you don't need a third, another software suite or something else to do it in. Um, it's pretty crazy when I first started at Tableau, Hunter was mentioning the software, I got trained on it and I was using it and I just hated it. So. I would do it in Excel or something else that I felt comfortable and that I could do and still scale outwards and not feel like it's gonna break. Um, Cause I was really trying to get it in Tableau with custom SQL of aggregating uh, postal codes together for leads and transactional data and then bringing it in Tableau and doing it that way. And that just didn't scale for trying to actually cluster things together and that's where we went outside and looked for additional help and that's Hunter came in and helped uh, improve our efficiencies like crazy. Um, Within territory construction, though, there's we'll talk through the geographic-based ones today, 
Um, but uh, one that I really want to call out is named account selection. So having that in place, because there will be the exceptions of things just don't fit into rule banks, right? You can't just say that these are how we're going to segment and that's it. There's going to be the sales leader at the highest level wants to make an exception. So having that process baked in from an order of operation standpoint of doing named account selection first in the process is extremely critical to know kind of what falls out into your geographic buckets. Um, for what's available and how you start kind of optimizing and balancing the territories. Um, next, in the next phases, we won't touch too much on from a technical standpoint, but having uh, the quota distribution for your roles and understanding kind of as you get into your commercial territory managers, your senior commercial territory managers, what is the range of quotas or what is the specific quota? Um, we've evolved, we've been evolving at Tableau where we're trying to decouple the concept of role to a quota because it puts so much limitations on growth and you have to kind of force people into roles that they're not maybe re ready for, but they do need to have a higher quota because their opportunity is so high. Um, and so you start looking at kind of what are the bands and different levels that you could potentially use. Um, we've actually in the last uh, two years implemented uh, field-based quotas, which are custom based on the account sets they have and the targets they set on the, account, um, on the accounts. And we're hoping in maybe next year's TC we'll bring that talk of how can you do custom-based quotas uh, using Tableau and some other solutions. Um, next is, as simple as it sounds, is sellers to territories. How do you actually go from creating territories and getting people associated and assigned into those seats? Um, and understanding how the quota distributes and how it adds up to your growth, your headcount, growth numbers, and so forth. Um, this is a critical, it's a, usually a fast pace because at that point you're kind of doing it in parallel, but it's also critical to make sure that you do this because there's situations of babysitting and situations of holdovers, and that's kind of where you're getting into kind of the um, finite details as you're getting ready for your uh, release of uh, releasing the new territories into your CRM system. Um, and then quickly, like I said, I don't want to lose sight of it, but assigning quotas to sellers from a comp plan perspective of here is your comp plan that says what you cover and your quota that you have. These are, as you scale upwards, are extremely important concepts for uh, legality with HR and FP&A and all those other uh, supporting systems that you have to have these in place so that then your commissions, tools, and things like that that you start having across. Um, it's extremely important to include those in, your, uh, in the process overall. Uh, and then lastly is issuing the plan documents, uh, just actually getting those into the hands and they can see them and understand what their comp plans are gonna be. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Hunter for uh, metric selection. Great, thank you, Justin. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, we have this idea of we're gonna go and we're gonna balance our sales territories in Tableau. Um, that's awesome. What are we gonna balance them on? Right. So that's where we need to start talking about metric selection, right? So now this is, there's no one size fits all approach to this. Even within Tableau, we use very different metrics for different lines of business and different levels of account maturity. <clears throat> for example, you might wanna use, these are just kind of a broad, painting with a broad stroke here, ideas. <clears throat> and you're gonna wanna go and customize them for your particular line of business. So we might wanna look at number of customers and we're gonna generally be speaking about this at the post code level. Right, the number of customers in that postal code, the number of transactions that have came from that postal code, the dollar amount of customer spend, uh, how many new customers came out of that postal code last year, uh, how, if you're in more of a uh, kind of renewals or subscription-based business, you may want to look at product adoption or saturation. Right? How many customers have only one product? How many customers only have, you know, what the number of licenses divided by a number of employees. Uh, well, the subscription renewal rate in that postal code. Um, and also lead flow, right, especially for a new business. For, like, I'll say, for example, in our case, if we're looking at a, a, a new business postal code, we might be looking at pipeline, lead flow, the number of customers that came out of that postal code in the last year. That They're not necessarily in that segment anymore, but a good future predictor for us has been Postal codes that produce lots of customers that go on and graduate to the named business tend to also produce a lot of really good new business accounts, right? I think of them as kind of like if you're into video games, like a spawn point, right? Like so, uh, you, uh, so some spawn points are really good, some are yeah, so so, uh, and often that's fairly stable uh, year to year. 
So you can kind of get outside of the box uh, depending on, on where you're at. If you're on more of a direct-to-consumer, uh, you might start want to start looking at demographic information in that postal code. What are key demographic factors? You know, people age you know, 34 to 55, income levels, et cetera. We're in B2B space. We tend, tend to not look at that so much. But this is one where you kind of have to, you know, there's no like one size fits all blueprint. And that's what's nice about using Tableau in this way is you can come up with what metrics work best for your line of business and implement them. Right. So I'm a data scientist. So what I want to do is after we've identified some metrics that we think are really good, and we're not going to cover this particularly in depth, but if you'd like to talk to me afterwards, we can talk at length. Uh, about the subject, uh, but what I like to do is once we've got our list of items, generally we kind of do a brainstorming session with uh, business leadership on what we think are really going to be good KPIs for future performance. And then what I want to go do is I want to build a model that tells me whether or not these are actually good indicators. Because sometimes we get suggestions that are incredible. It's like spot on, I never would have thought of that. Other times we get suggestions that are pretty bad. There's like zero correlation, essentially random, you know, at best. And what we want to know, we want to quantify that and figure out, okay, is this a legitimate good indicator of quality or is it, you know, it's somebody's like pet idea, but there's no evidence to, to actually show that it's worth anything. Right. So as part of this process, what you're going to want to do, this is like uh, data science in uh, 60 seconds or less. Uh, you're going to want to develop a training set that's gonna help guide your selection, right? So that training set, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kinda of rewind the clock if your sales cycle is on a year, like most folks, we're gonna rewind the clock one year. We're gonna look at what this postal code gave us between you know, like yesterday and a year back from yesterday in terms of sales or whatever our key metric is, transactions. You know, I'll generally just use sales here to keep it simple. Then from that date one year ago, we're gonna rewind the clock another year or two years, depending on how far back you wanna go. You could do both also. We're gonna look at what things looked like, so today is November 14th, 2019. So we would start, our training set would be sales November 13th, 2018 to November 13th, 2019. And then we would look at how many leads we had as of November 13th, 2018 how many had we seen in the last year? So that would be leads from November 13th, 2017 to leads November 13th, 2018. We do that with some of our other metrics as well. Right, and we'd also look at what were the aggregate sales as of November 13th, 2018. And then we can build a model. You can build a linear model. You could actually do that in Excel if you're so inclined. Uh, there's a lot of other tools. I like R. There's probably three dozen tools on the market that all do a pretty good job of building linear models. There's other stuff too. Um, this could be an entire separate sidebar. But regardless, this is our target. We're gonna wanna train our data on our target. We're gonna see what those correlations look like. And largely we're looking to see if there's even a relationship at all, right? Because we don't wanna start weighting territories on stuff that just doesn't matter, right? And so we'll kinda leave it at that. But generally, do it if you can. Right. So we're gonna just kind of a quick peek on clustering geographies and why we want to do that. Uh, so what clustering really gives us, we use a k-means clustering uh, in our process, uh, and that lets us subset these postal codes. We've got, uh, I'm trying to remember, we've got around 900 post codes in Washington, I believe. So what we're able to do with this k-means clustering uh, is there's some logic in this script that you guys are gonna get on the GitHub page. And it basically, you, you feed in how many territories you wanna produce and we're going to check and make sure that the clusters we make aren't bigger than the minimum, than the maximum size of a territory. Right. So this will become a little bit more clear, but here's just kind of a teaser as we go through of what this is gonna look like. Right. So we're gonna kind of very briefly give you a background on our kind of hypothetical, semi-hypothetical use case. Right. So we're using everyone's favorite data set, Superstore. So we need to plan territories for three account managers in 2019. And so the way that we like to do it at Superstore is we like to create actually three territories per account manager. 
That way, if someone leaves and we need to have their ter territories be babysat, it's not one person gets one giant territory and the other person gets nothing. We can split them up. If we hire a new person at Superstore, we can just give them one territory from each of the other reps that was already there, or one territory from the two guys who are maybe having you know, more leads than they can call on. This gives us a lot of flexibility. You know, we're basically got more jigsaw pieces. We can move around. We're spending just a little bit more time up front. Because remember, in this model, creating a territory doesn't really take us that long anymore. So why not create a few more and save ourselves a ton of work later on? So we built this linear model at Superstore. Uh, and we found that the, there are really only three factors that contribute to the future value of a postal code. How many transactions there have been in the lifetime of that postal code, the number of customers, and how much spend we've seen in dollars in the last two years. So our information is at the transaction level. The text is small to represent the granularity and also because it's hard to resize. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna aggregate to our smallest unit. So we've got these kind of like line, line item levels. In prep, we're gonna go ahead and aggregate up to the postal code level because we want it to map out the ownership of every single postal code, uh, regardless of whether we have any customers in there today because we want to avoid conflict if we get a lead from a postal code where we've never done business before. We want to have a clear line of ownership, right? This is, goes back to our swim lanes model where you know, we want to reduce the amount of times people sa spell on basically non-ROI activities. And arguing over who owns a lead is a non-ROI activity. That's, yeah, just really quickly, we have a dashboard in Tableau in our internals where if somebody wants to know who owns this postal code, they literally just type in the postal code and it'll give them, by the segmentation, who is the rep to contact. That's how we speed up that efficiencies and as new reps come on or we scale processes outwards with external teams or third party vendors, we're able to use that information to implement into the processes immediately and it's still controlled in terms of who owns what postal code is a simple business question that's answered within a 10 second question or answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all about just non, you know, reducing the amount of time on non-value add stuff and our account, account disputes is total non-value add. Uh, so as we're getting our metrics right, we notice one thing, we wanna, we said that we're gonna wait 30% on transactions and 40% on spend. Well, how, do we, how are we gonna add transactions and spend together? So we have this problem of, you know, if we want to wait on employees too, right? We want to add 2,000 employees, 30% weight, and $100,000 in sales, 40% weight. Well, that's, that's not really a math mathematical operation there in two very different units, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to scale that data. And what you'll see that we're going to go and scale it in prep. So this is kind of a wordy slide. I'm going to go ahead and distill it down what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for the maximum that we see in our data set. So if the most that we see in our data set is 10,000 employees, we're gonna go ahead and just capture that. You think about an LOD or in prep, you know, like a prep LOD like we saw this morning. This is the perfect use case for that. It would save me a few steps in my workflow you're gonna see later. If we're gonna take that maximum, we're gonna create it as a new field. And then at that postal code level, we divide what we actually see in that postal code by the data set maximum. And then I like to multiply it by 1,000 to get a nice, large, more round number that we can all interpret instead of just arguing over like down to the thousands decimal, decimal place. It's not ideal. Uh, so we make it into a bigger number. And then we can add them all together because they're all on the same scale. And ideally, when you do your linear model, that's how you're going to stage your data as well so that your weightings are uniform and interpretable. But again, that's like a data science sidebar. All right, so now we're gonna get to the demo part. So these are pre-recorded, and what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna kind of give us a brief narration uh, as we go through here. Right, so pause one second. So the way, who here understands how our server and Tableau prep work together? Okay, we got like a 15%. So I'm gonna take one minute, and we'll go over it quickly. So Tableau Prep has got a tool where you, as of 2019.2, I think, uh, or maybe 2019.3, there's a tool where you can add a script. If you are not on a, a version that's that recent, you should go look up this same talk from last year 
because we show you how to do it without the integration into prep. It's a couple more steps, but it still totally works. Uh, we're going to cover kind of how to do it in the new world, uh, and you can look us, if you can't do it now, you can look us up later whenever you guys get around to upgrading. Um, so this script tool, we don't integrate R actually inside of prep. When you install prep, you do not get R as well. What you get is the ability to call out to a, an R server. Now, if you don't have an R server in your organization, like hope is not lost, you can ins you install R locally, and it runs a local server. So the whole process is self-contained on your PC. You're just creating this little kind of fake server that then prep is calling out to, and then it's sending data back to prep. So the configuration is very simple. R is free. I like R Studio. It provides a nice little front end to it. You get the whole thing in one package. And then it opens the door for you to do lots of data science-y stuff if you ever get involved in that. So the steps to starting our server, I'm going to show you the entire thing. After you install two libraries, they install in about one minute. Now what we're going to do here is we're just going to add that library. And then we're going to add our server client. You don't have to, but our server client is what lets us kind of cleanly shut down our server when we're done. But you can also just restart your PC instead but that's kind of annoying. So what we're doing here, and unfortunately there's a text box that kind of blocks it, is once we've started our server, we just say our serve and then we specify a port. If you don't specify a port, it uses the default port. And all we're doing here is we're just verifying that it's running. So we've gone up, we said our serve at port 6311, and then this system command uh, is totally optional, and that's just me showing evidence that hey, it's actually running. So now we're going to quickly hop into a prep workflow. I'm going to drag it over here. Perfect. And this, oh, this could get really tricky, actually. So, one moment is I'm going to display a mirror for one second. So here we've got a prep workflow. So what's going on here is we have our orders, and we are filtering them down to US only, and we're grouping them at the postal code level, and we're adding in latitude and longitudes from US postal codes. So this is a, a pretty simple kind of filter and join. Uh, a key call out here is that we're keeping all of the US postal codes, even if we have no sales data and no customer data from them. Because again, we want to make sure that every postal code is mapped to somebody. Um, so we're creating our data set maximum value at this point so we can do our scaling like we discussed. Uh, again, this now, uh, whenever that next version of prep comes out, it'll be a much simpler process. Uh, and we just create a little dummy join field where two fields that are both calculated as one, we use that to join back together and, and calculate the global maximum. And then we calculate our index, so we divide them all uh, by the global maximum, multiply the result by 1,000, and then uh, we add them together and scale appropriately. So where the part is where most people will get tripped up, and I want to spend a second to go over it so you guys don't have that same problem, is you're going to add this little script node in here. So to add a script node, you right click. and go add script. You can see that there. So when you add script, you're going to get this dialog box. And you're going to choose our serve, and you're going to connect to localhost 6311. And the file name is going to be that territory cluster script that's in there that's included. So in your connection dialog box, it's very simple. Localhost, port 6311. And now that's going to let you send data back to the R server. So one thing that you need to know is that when you feed that data in there, the script wants uh, specific fields. So it wants to, territories is where you're going to specify the number of territories that you want to create. 
It's going to need a postal code. That's going to be a unique key. Uh, the state, it's going to do, create all those clusters within whatever you put in state. If you're doing international, you may want to put country in there as state. Uh, it's okay. There's no like geographic rule that says like, oh no, it's a country. Like I'm stopping. It just uses it as a thing to iterate over. Uh, the index is the value that you want to use for distributing equally, and then a latitude and longitude, so we can do our geospatial clustering. So we'll feed, we feed that in there. We get back clusters, and then we clean and we join our counting data back in. So now, I'm going to go back to my extended display mode here. So we started. We saw our prep workflow. Now that once we finish running our prep workflow, we'll go ahead and shut down our serve. Just because it takes up a few system resources in the background, and we might as well just shut it down while we're thinking about it. Shutting down is pretty simple. We tell it our serve shutdown using the connection object we created. And again, uh, if you don't do this, it's fine. Nothing terrible will happen. Uh, you'll just have a little server daemon going on in the background until you restart. But you can see it only takes up like 46 megabytes of memory. So it's, uh, it's less than one tab in Chrome. And again, that's if you're running it locally to your yeah. desktop machine. If you guys have it hosted on your Tableau server, then everything's nice. Yep, so now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna create territories in Tableau. So this is sped up slightly. This is about, sped up about 15, 20%, uh, just because it feels slightly painfully slow to watch someone do it in true real time if you're not actually watching them like move around. Uh, but start to finish, this is, an, uh, you know, without acceleration, about a 14 minute process that we're gonna watch right now. All right, so we've got our data that we output from this prep flow. What we're doing here is we're making sure that Tableau knows that postal code is a geographic unit. And we've, we've, our script has created this field called cluster. And this is kind of like, here's the big thing that's gonna really enable us to do this well in Tableau. And this was the game changer when we added this to Tableau a couple years ago, was the ability to create geography from another unit. So what we just did here, we're gonna go and we're gonna say, that cluster is actually a conglomeration of postal codes. We just did create geometry from postal code. So that tells Tableau that when I add postal code on here, that this is the unit. So we can see all these individual postal codes now belong to one cluster and one cluster only. And those clusters are gonna vary depending on how much index, which is our, our, our uh, measure of equality, how much index is in each cluster. Right, so we're not aiming to have every cluster be the exact same size, but we are wanting to make sure that every cluster is not over a certain size. Right, so there's all of our clusters right now that we created using this script. So now we've gone down from uh, 42,000 to 168 polygons. So it's a whole lot easier to allocate 168 polygons than it is 42,000. So I wanna also add this, this was like a one take I didn't reshoot this recording, so there are a couple times when I undo, but I want to give like a realistic look at what it's like to actually do this uh, in Tableau. So what I'm doing here is I'm calculating what my average index should be for a territory that I'm going to create, because remember I'm going to create nine. You could do this in Excel or on your desktop calculator, but I like to do it as part of the workbook, so I just kind of have the whole evidence stream just saved in one workbook, right? So now I'm kind of creating my upper and lower bounds there. What I did was I calculated, and you're gonna see here, a range, which is plus or minus 5% from the target, because we can't always nail like 100% exactly, like on the nose, it's got to have 3,259 points of index or else. Um, so we're, we kind of give ourselves like a plus or minus 5% buffer. In an ideal situation, we might weight that, like we might choose our slightly high territories strategically or, you know, someone owns like one high territory and two low territories or, you know, certain places that are very inconvenient to get to. Like in this example, we, whoever owns Alaska and Hawaii gets a little bit extra, um, you know. So it's all gonna depend on kind of your line of business and, and how you wanna do that. So what we're doing here is we're actually, we're just using the group tool, the lasso. We're selecting them and we're adding to a group. 
And then the next thing I do after that to make sure that I select everybody is then I filter to only show the ungrouped polygons. So we just created one territory here. And now we're kind of in the lower left hand, if you look, you can see what the sum of index is. And I know it's probably pretty small, but that's what we're looking at. If, in a perfect world, I would have this blown up and larger, so it was a little bit less of a small thing to stare at. But that, in the lower left, that is what, showing us how many index each one of those has. Right. So we're gonna keep going here. I missed one little polygon, and that's why we're redoing this one. I just kind of control Z'd it and went back. Uh, but what's nice is even that was pretty quick. So what I'm gonna show here now is as I go, what I like to do is I like to create a little kind of mini dashboard to track myself called territory balance. And what I'll do is I'll add my cluster group in there and then I can see how well that kind of balance is working out as I go through to make sure I'm not kind of uniformly missing really low uh, for whatever reason. And just to call out some of these things too, right? Like if you're talking about as you get bigger, we're only doing nine reps here, but if you want to think about if you already have predefined boundaries of your districts or your subregions, you can carve those out and do them individually. So for example, you could take all your East Coast states and go in through this process without having to do end to end territory yeah. carving or be able to, uh, for our perspective, like if you have regional teams, you're able to actually kind of say like, hey, um, Sam, on you're responsible for the commercial East team. Here's that data set. Work with your leaders to get a set of territories. What they are, we don't really care as long as they're fair and balanced and equal, but you have that ability to actually go and directly work. Um, and that's where we see a lot of the value of being able to do these type of things where you can pre-carve them and bring them to a leader and then sit in a meeting and say, in an hour, right? And okay, well, let's take this one postal code that's inside of this cluster and actually move it to this other one it's simple and easy to do. It doesn't require you to go back into the software. You're actually doing it live. And as you get good with Tableau and the skill sets of desktop and how to undo stuff and do that, it just speeds up the process crazy amount. Um, but it takes that initial kind of just one or two iterations to go through until you learn it. But once you do, it's like riding a bike. It's just, it becomes a little fun to do. Once you, we're excited once we get to the territory carving stage to do it again, just because it is, it's like a Lego. It's putting together a you're building something that ultimately ends up yeah. that you can say, what are the territory sizes? How can you share that out to marketing and to finance and so forth? Yeah, some people really enjoy this more than others. We had one person who was on our commercial territory team and this was like her favorite part, of, favorite time of the year. It was because she would just like, she would do hundreds of these and we just do them by the district. And she's like, oh, this is great. I just like, kind of like get in this Zen mode. I listen to a podcast and I just like create these things. And I've never heard anyone say like getting into sort of like a Zen mode and enjoying using like, a, you know, some of these other ones uh, <laughs> that we've tried in the past. Uh, so uh, to me, that was kind of like a big endorsement. Uh, that's like, oh, it's like my favorite time of the year. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I do, I do find it visually, but I'm also a, uh, a geography person. I'm a geographer by education. Um, and also it, that was my, my work as a moth trapper was as a geographer uh, as well. So uh, something that I really enjoy. So it kind of, I maybe get more of a kick out of it than some folks, I'll, I readily admit. Oh. Yeah, yeah. so in the interest of time, we'll fast forward slightly here, uh, just because I want to have uh, a chance to kind of get through all the material. Uh, and I know we'll make sure the rooms get set up for the next folks. So we're almost done here. And we're just going to make our last territory. So now what I'm going to show here, just real quick, is how close we are to making a dashboard. And again, we'll have this stuff all yeah. available. We have a finished dashboard too that's on Tableau Public yeah. that's under my name, but yeah. Um, yeah. essentially it's the same concept. Yeah, the link to that is on our to. GitHub as well. Right. And so what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna very quickly make a uh, interactive dashboard for our folks to look at. And this is how we're gonna go deliver them to our uh, stakeholders. When we say like, hey, here's our, our territory proposal for your business unit, here you go. We're just going to kind of quickly recreate, but we're going to have our cluster names in there. So we've got those. And then we're going to create at the bottom, we're going to have all, we've brought in all of our stuff that we use to balance the territories. So now when you click on the territory, you're going to be able to see uh, how many distinct customer accounts there were, what the sales were in the last two years, how many transactions there have been, et cetera.
Yeah, and just to touch on again about the territory creation, we used to do a two to one ratio for our sales reps back in 2014, 15. Um, and we found that to be too big actually as we had uh, people coming and leaving and changing teams and so forth. And so nowadays we actually do it anywhere from four to six uh, per headcount. And really what we like about that is that enables sales managers to have a puzzle piece to move around so that if one territory does have some anomaly or there's a big deal where it's gonna be super heavily weighted for that rep, you can take three of those territories that were supposed to be six for that person and now you can redistribute those to other people in the team which is nice, you don't have to reissue comp plans, you don't have to do that type of stuff that takes downstream operational work. You're just moving the puzzle piece from one team to another, keeping those boundary lines um, and knowing who owns that territory that's associated to that postal code. Yep. Yep. So here's our example of dashboard that we built. We just basically put our kind of metrics we were using before out there and then we were ready to go. And again, this is part of the um, item as well. So. I'm gonna make sure I wanna get that GitHub link up there for you before we finish. So, you know, I hope we've showed you you can build a territories, you know, quick, cheap, easy with Tableau. People will be happier, but you still have to make sure that everyone's aligned, your rules of engagement are there. Uh, once you start needing to create a lot of territories, this geospatial clustering is where we really are able to kind of harness the power of Tableau uh, once we need to go to something more granular than the state level. Uh, and that's all, it's kind of like my shout out to Dev. Customer, uh, custom geography from a field is like awesome. It is a super game changer for us. Uh, being able to use that cluster ID and getting the geography from the post code, you know, super helpful. Uh, this is the one you're gonna wanna take a picture of. You should get the materials, but yeah, just yep. in case we have them. And while you're taking one. a picture, I'm gonna make our plug for complete, please complete the session survey in the mobile app. Um, we get invited back to speak again next year if our, we get good session evaluations uh, or, or any session evaluations. Uh, if we don't get any session evaluations or get really terrible evaluations, they will tell us to go find something else to do uh, instead. So if you'd like to hear us again, uh, you know, go ahead and give us evaluation. Or if you have something, some really constructive feedback, um, we'd yeah. love to hear it as well. Please put it in the notes. We read we, through them all. And 